Good afternoon to all the friends that uh, are online and uh, good afternoon to all the friends here in the Zambia Italian Cultural Center. Good afternoon to Professor Costantino Dorazio, uh, who is always uh, uh, our mentor in our cultural events uh, and I'm very happy to see him. And a special welcome to our friend, uh, Maestro Pietro Ruffo. Pietro, you are uh, really most welcome here uh, in Zambia, uh, in a virtual mode, but uh, in our heart, absolutely. Uh, I welcome you at the Zambia Italian Cultural Center that I hope um, soon you will be able to visit uh, in person here in Lusaka. So I will uh, introduce uh, our webinar today for our guests and uh, I will start by saying that uh, today we uh, celebrate in uh, around the world, this week actually, we celebrate, but today in Lusaka we celebrate uh, the 16th Italian Contemporary Art Day. So uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs of Italy established uh, to celebrate the contemporary art all around the world because uh, contemporary art is uh, very important in uh, our culture and in the culture around the world at the global level because uh, art is uh, as we uh, have been saying in all uh, the events that we have organized here in Lusaka too art art is uh, uh, a form of uh, communication uh, between people that uh, allows people to share emotions, feelings, languages that uh, go beyond uh, boundary. So we are convinced that art uh, is uh, key also in strengthening the relations between Italy and Zambia. So, Today uh, we have uh, uh, our guests, uh, Costantino Dorazio and Pietro Ruffo, who will uh, guide us in a conversation uh, on, uh, on uh, contemporary art. Pietro Ruffo is uh, a very well-known Italian uh, artist. Uh, he is uh, one of the most uh, acclaimed artists of uh, his uh, generation. And uh, I am uh, a great admirer of his art. Uh, we are proud uh, to say that uh, uh, some uh, art pieces of Pietro are part of the art collection of the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Rome. Maybe not uh, all our guests know, and uh, I'm happy to share with them that uh, some years ago, uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs in Rome created uh, an art collection, and uh, many contemporary artists were selected to be part of this collection. Pietro is one of these artists, and uh, it's a great honor to have him with us today. I must say it's also a great honor to uh, host one of his art pieces in the Italian residence here in Lusac. It's uh, really a privilege. It's a beautiful uh, uh, piece of art that I hope will be part of this conversation too. Uh, the title is uh, Italia Fatta Pezzi, Italy in Pieces. And I think it's uh, an important uh, art piece uh, of the work of uh, Pietro uh, that uh, symbolizes also the engagement of Pietro in addressing uh, many important and uh, very up-to-date uh, subjects, very sensitive, like migrations, like uh, environment, uh, like uh, the challenges for uh, uh, humankind and I think this is a, a very 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 important time where we can discuss about uh, the subjects also for the particular conditions uh, we live uh, in these days because of the pandemic. Um, the work of Pietro focuses also on Africa 
and I think that is also another uh, important point uh, for our conversation today. But I think, uh, uh, and I know that the conversation between uh, Costantino and Pietro will uh, uh, be widespread around uh, uh, subjects that uh, are of interest of the whole world and the, the global level. I would like to uh, say, this is an important point that uh, for me, uh, today we welcome uh, uh, Pietro Rufo with us uh, in a um, virtual way, uh, in a digital uh, uh, event, but I really hope that uh, very soon he will be able to visit uh, Zambia to uh, do the project that we uh, discussed before I, I came here uh, more than one year ago, uh, the project of uh, a period of residence uh, where Pietro will be able to stay uh, in Zambia to uh, deepen his research and to get into contact uh, with uh, the Zambian artists, uh, the Zambian reality for a mutually beneficial experience. and. Uh, we really look forward to hosting uh, Pietro here in Lusaka. So, in a way, today is uh, our first uh, moment of a broader project that uh, uh, I really want to uh, accomplish together uh, with Professor Dorazio and uh, Maestro Pietro Ruffo. So, I will uh, now pass the floor to you for the conversation. And uh, I will be here. I think uh, uh, we will be able uh, to hear at a certain point questions uh, from our friends who are following us uh, online. And uh, anyway, I will uh, take the floor also at the end uh, to uh, interact with you. So thank you very much. Thank you, Ambassador. Thank you very much for all those that are there attending physically and those uh, uh, connected to this webinar. Uh, well, I, um, I don't want to speak that long because I want to, to, to leave as, time, as, as much time as we can to Pietro to introduce his work. But first of all, I want to give you some uh, uh, introduction, a little introduction about his work and his uh, career. Pietro uh, was born in 1978, uh, so we can consider him a mid-career artist. You know that, I don't know if it's like that also in, in Zambia, but in Italy, we have the, the bad habit to consider an artist, a young artist, even if it's been working for already 20 or 25 years. Uh, now, Pietro has been working uh, on, on more than, on, for more than 20 years now, and he is actually, in, in, in the, mid, uh, the middle part of his career, he already had many, many um, possibilities to show his work in international and institutional situations. Uh, he has pieces in public collections. Some of them, we're gonna see them during the webinar. But first, but moreover, he's an artist that I think is the perfect uh, proof of how much art in Italy developed and how much art in Italy still is still able to tell something about our contemporary world. Um, we've been uh, talking about uh, uh, Michelangelo, about Raphael, about Leonardo when I was there in Zambia, and we all consider them today artists that are still alive but they don't talk about our time. They talk about our identity, identity that we all share because they made a job, they made a work, they made an art that went beyond the borders of Italy or Europe or any other country they may have worked in. Now, even if uh, um, Pietro was born in Italy and even if most of his work is, is done in Italy, his art speaks the language of the world. I'm sure you will find many points of connection 
many references in his work that speak about your, also your daily life, your concerns, your interests. And this is something quite rare to find, not only in an Italian artist, but in any artist all over the world. So when uh, Ambassador uh, Maggiore asked me to find an Italian artist, to, to contact an Italian artist that would be interesting to introduce for the uh, Contemporary Art Day, I immediately thought of him because his work is based on topics that are like, they can be shared all over the world. Now he's an architect, as education. And this idea of being an architect, as he's gonna explain quite well in his uh, uh, lecture, uh, is really part of the starting point and of the daily, of the work that he makes on a daily basis. That's why, in order to understand why I'm saying that being an architect, being somebody that studied how to draw how to draw a building, how to draw urban plan, how to make, how to think of a drawing in order to make it real in three dimension. So in order to understand why this part of the education of uh, Pietro got into his job uh, and, and mulled it quite uh, well, uh, I will ask Pietro now to share his screen and uh, start a video. Now, we already know that because of the connection, the internet connection, the audio of this video is not perfect, but you have title, subtitles that you can read in English. He's gonna speak in Italian in this video, but you can read in English the, the, the titles. And you will see um, Pietro introducing the district where he works, his atelier, but on top of this, he's going to show you the technique that he uses to make most of his art pieces. I think it's a perfect starting point to get into his world that then, taking the word, he's going to start telling us work by work, year by year, face by face. Thank you, Pietro, for the video now. Sono Pietro Ruffo, sono un disegnatore romano. Questo è il mio studio, sono a San Lorenzo, in un'ex fabbrica di pasta. San Lorenzo nel tempo si è trasformato, ma tiene sempre un'anima popolare, ma si è riempito di ragazzi. E, insomma, è un quartiere molto, molto vivo. Questo è il pastificio Cerve, il palazzo dove ho lo studio, che dalla fine degli anni Ottanta è diventato un palazzo di artisti. Questa libreria rappresenta un po' quello che ho nella testa, insetti, mappe. Ogni lavoro che faccio è un frullato degli elementi che stanno qua dentro e che poi voglio va su carta. E questo è il mio lavoro, lavoro fatto di carta, utilizzando bisturi, pinze, fili di spilli. Tanta pazienza e molte martellate. Questa è parte della Mercedes, che appunto io amo molto, perché è questa natura che ti sovrasta, cammini all'interno del tessato e poi ci sono tutte queste piante che sono tra l'altro le piante che io dipingo in alcuni dei miei quadri. Una delle cose che mi piace più di Roma è il concetto di stratificazione. Qui in questo punto si vede l'acquedotto felice che poi diventa una villa rinascimentale, che deve diventare l'arco di Sisto Quinto e poi bruscamente interrotto dalla stazione Terra. Tutti questi livelli, tutti questi periodi, uno dopo l'altro, mi fanno pensare che ora è il nostro periodo e che ora noi dobbiamo fare qualcosa per questa città.
Thank you very much, Pietro. It's a pleasure and thanks a lot for the nice introduction, Mr. Ambassador. It was a, a pleasure and I really hope that I can join you uh, really soon. And uh, thanks a lot, Costantino. And thanks to everyone who is hearing us. And it's a true pleasure to share with you some of my work during the last 20 years, I would say. And uh, I would begin with uh, 2004, when in south of Russia, mostly in uh, Os North Ossetia, it's a country that is near to Chechnya, there was a terrible terrorist attack. Uh, this terrorist attack was made inside the school, the school number one of Beslan, and unfortunately, many, many children died. It was really something horrible. And so the Italian government decided to uh, offer to Beslan a new hospital, and also the Italian government invite some artists to work with children that were uh, alive from the terrorist attack. And I was one of these artists. I was quite young, I was like 23 or 24 years old. And really this experience uh, gave me a lot. When I was back in my country, in Italy, I decided to do a work. This work want to look about the, the landscape, if the landscape in this region could in a certain way give us the idea of the conflict. And the landscape, it's done by mountain, uh, rivers, and there isn't any trace of the conflict on the landscape. As you can see, this mountain are so quiet, so silent. So, to understand where, where the trace of the conflict, I have done an installation, a sort of temple done with a mylar that is a transparent paper. And inside the temple, there were drawn at the classroom uh, of the school, destroyed after the terrorist attack. And inside the classroom, I, I have drawn the children with whom I have worked with. And they are the only element, as you can see, that are drawn with color. So the idea was that the architecture was still destroyed after one year when I visit this place. But the children have a sort of new energy, uh, a new life. Pietro, sorry, you know I will interrupt you many times today because this is our agreement. What I would like you to tell us is uh, the technique that you used to make this because maybe through these images uh, people don't understand that this architecture is made on with paper and it was also papers and drawings, the, the, um, let's say, the art pieces that you hung on the walls, right? So what kind of paper was that? So first of all, uh, the mountain that you have seen are painted on canvas, but in a really special way. It's like a fresco. You know, uh, Costantino, you know very well, you are an historian, uh, the technique of fresco. Uh, to do a fresco on a wall, you need to paint when the surface is wet. Uh, so I have tried to use the same technique on canvas. So first of all, uh, for every day, uh, working day, um, there was a part that was prepared, wet. I, I painted on top of them with mountain, uh, the river, and after I cover another time with plaster, with gesso. And so painting, it's really inside the, the medium of the canvas and of the gesso. Um, for the installation, as you have said, it's a paper installation drawn with graphite. And it's really interesting for me because as you have said, uh, I am an architect. So I want, to, I want that the paper that is a fragile material 
would be uh, strong to build up a temple. So to make this, I have used a paper, not like this one, but a transparent one. I have, let's say like this, I have drawn just a part of the paper and after I folded to create a column. And so the, the paper is self-standing. You don't need anything uh, is self-standing and just the paper create the space. Obviously, you know that there are many deformations. If from a bidimensional surface, you go to a three-dimensional surface. So to think about this perspective, uh, deformation, I have in a certain way uh, calculated, if we can say this, and think how the work will be once that it would be rolled on. This is very interesting, Pietro, because uh, um, uh, first of all, this is something that is quite recurrent in your work. You first start with an idea, with, a, with, a, with an event, uh, with a place, uh, with some people that you work with. Um, Pietro does a lot of workshops, and I really hope we're going to be able to organize some workshops for when he's going to come to Zambia. And then you get down to images, always different, always with a different technique. In this case, you behaved just like an artist of the Renaissance, uh, building an architecture that surrounds us. And so it needs to take care of the perspective, of the heights, uh, of all of the um, optical uh, details uh, that an, uh, an architecture and a wall um, even if it's a weird wall, it's a particular peculiar wall, a wall painting needs to take care of. Okay, thank you. Yes, uh, in fact, Costantino, uh, it's true what you're saying. Um, I wish I was a bohemian artist uh, or a romantic artist that could create a wonderful masterpiece during a night. Unfortunately, I'm not that kind of artist. Also, if I've tried to be that kind of artist, but I, I am not. So, uh, as you have seen in the first video that I have shown you, um, in my my studio, it's full of young guy that help me working. Everything it's planned uh, and uh, organized. Also, you are in an artist studio, so the organization arrives until a certain point and after creativity comes. But uh, when you told that it's like a Renaissance atelier, uh, that's, that's, that's true. And I, I invite all of you to come and visit me in Rome to be a nice experience. So uh, let's go ahead with uh, some images that I would like to show you. Uh, as you know, uh, contemporary artists usually work with symbol and they create their own alphabet to uh, make composition and to talk about some topics that interest them. The first topic uh, that I was really interested is the topic of self-defense. To go uh, and to study this topic, um, I have created a symbol, I have used a symbol that is a symbol uh, of skull of animal. Why I have used this kind of symbol? First of all, uh, the skull of animal gives me an idea of aggression. As you can see in these images, the skull have their mouth, their open mouth with the teeth in evidence that gives you this idea of aggression. But in another way, the skull could represent like fossil. And so the idea of layering of a population in his territory during history. For that reason, I have used the symbol of skull of animal to build up some national uh, flags. For example, here we can see the flags of Lebanon, Lebanon, uh, the flag of Iran, the flag, the flag of Israel. And the idea of those kind of works was that uh, to represent population that feel an everyday 
uh, tailing of self-defense. The self-defense could be between their own governor or the self-defense could be between um, another country nearby their country uh, or nearby or another population with another kind of religion. So it's an everyday feeling of self-defense. Uh, this work, uh, it's about Syria. And as you can see, everything is hand drawn with graphite on paper. So it's a very, very uh, simple medium, a very simple technique. And it's the technique that I have used to do my first solo show. I was in an in a Italian museum. I was 27 years old and they asked me to do this show in a museum in Pesaro, that is in the east part of, east of Italy. And there is this incredible room, a giant room, as you can see. Uh, it's high, like 20 meters. And I decided to do my show just with paper and graphite and to exhibit six national uh, flags. Here you can see a little bit uh, better how the scale, okay. mm -hmm. the scale of, of, of the work. But if you think a little bit about this uh, idea of self-defense, let's do a step forward. Usually in Europe, uh, before the Second World War, we used to have the Ministry of the War. So uh, someone that is the Ministry of War and inside there, is, there are tanks, airplane, army, uh, etc. If you think a little bit about it, after the Second World War, we still have a ministry, but this it's more the Ministry of War, but it's the Ministry of Defense. So I was quite interested in how the world changed from war into defense. For that reason, I have done other flag, like the one that you can see on, on the top of these images. The first one in your left, it's the flag of UK, the middle one, it's the flag of USA, and the last one on the top, it's the flag of China. The idea was that it's true that maybe UK don't have to do now in our day a war against uh, Ireland or France, they used to, but not now. Uh, but they use the word self-defense to make action far away the borderline. So to make action, I don't know, in Asia or in other parts of the world. South America. The same thing about the United States or China or other country. So the idea of the work, every time, the idea of the work, it's uh, mostly to have a question mark, uh, not uh, Media, it's, it's to, to pose a question rather to uh, give answer to, to a topic. Pietro, uh, the, the last, the last uh, statement that you made, it is exactly what I think contemporary art does all the time. When it's real contemporary art, it doesn't give answers. It mostly pose questions that sometimes we don't pose to ourselves. Now, what I want to tell you here, and I want to ask you, is the role of the symbol. What's for you, what is for you a symbol, like the skull here, and we're gonna see other symbols after in other kind of series that you, that you make. Is, is it, first of all, I think that the symbol makes coherent all of the body of work that you make in a certain phase in a certain part. But what's the role of a symbol? What if in this work you didn't have a symbol like the skull? Yeah, uh, as I told you before, the symbol, it's a sort of alphabet that artists create to, uh, 
to compose his work. It's obviously, uh, in, my, in my way of thinking, the alphabet should be more, and uh, you should share your alphabet with more and more people. In the meaning that uh, I can use every kind of symbol, but after, if people um, don't understand what I'm talking about, it's, uh, it's not that interesting. Uh, for that reason, uh, Costantino, I, I would like to show you another symbol that I have used in my work, that it's this beetle. You know, uh, this insect, it's an insect that we can find in different parts of the world, but I have used it um, to talk about a major topic, the, the problem between Israel and Palestine. And you have to know that in the desert, in this region, um, this kind of beetle live part of the day under the sand. Uh, and after um, the evening, it fly out of the sand and it, it do what he have to do. So I have used this symbol another time to uh, represent the strong layer of the population of Israel uh, during history in his territory, and a population linked by the faith. In fact, all this insect uh, comes from uh, Jewish prayer, and a population that needs a form of aggression uh, to defend themselves, to stay in the territory where they are uh, layered. Another time, this is for me a question mark. The question mark is a tank could be a form of defense or it's a form of aggression. Uh, I can't reply to this question, uh, but uh, it's interesting for me to, to do this kind of, uh, of question. Uh, and so this tank was done on wood and it's a real size tank, so it's quite, quite big. Um, At the same time, Pietro, he's also very light, no? He's also very delicate, he's also very fragile. The intervention you set on top of the wood with cutting these papers, and, uh, and then I will, later on we'll ask you something about this technique, it, it makes this not so dangerous. I mean, it doesn't look dangerous. It, it is closer to a toy than a real tank. Uh, you're completely true in the meaning that this is the kind of contrast that I'm looking uh, doing this kind of work. So imagine, first of all, uh, imagine a young children that is playing with his uh, small tank and say, I want to build a a real tank in real size and doing this uh, this work being an artist it's like you can uh, make through your dream your when you was a baby mm -hmm. second point it's that the kind of material that i use paper uh, have inside this contrast it's really fragile material but when you write something on top of it it could be really, really strong. So for me, the contrast between uh, the fragility and the strongness of this material, uh, it's a little bit part of my poetic. And also, you know, as you have said, uh, a war machine uh, done on paper, it's something that let us uh, think about what is war and uh, what are the game, let's say, between yeah. the war. Perfect, thank you. Um, so as you have understand, I, was, I am quite, interesting, quite interested in topic about history, about people, and uh, about humankind in general. And a philosopher that I have loved a lot, it's Isaiah Berlin. Isaiah Berlin was a liberal thinker teacher at Oxford University during the 60s and the 70s, and used to talk about many topics, but the one that gives him uh, more success was certainly 
uh, his idea of freedom. He used to define uh, two kinds of freedom, negative freedom and positive freedom. So when he used to say negative and positive, you don't have to understand these as bad or good. It's more like a battery with a negative pole and a negative pole. What is negative freedom? Negative freedom is the freedom from someone. It's the freedom from a despot. It's the freedom from an autocratic government. So it could be an individual freedom. Positive freedom, it's more like an idea of collective freedom. So the idea is that, yes, I am free, but I have to be free with the group, with the society that is around me. And all together go through a common goal, that is freedom for everyone. Isaiah Berlin uh, used to divide, you know, between uh, during the Second World War, the Occidental bloc with an idea of negative and let's say so individual freedom and the uh, communist bloc uh, with an idea of collective freedom. To study Isaiah Berlin and to talk uh, of his thought, I have used a symbol, another type, another one. This time, <clears throat> sorry, this time the symbol, it's the dragonfly. You know, this, it's a fantastic animal, a fantastic insect. Dragonfly have uh, two pair of um, wings and it can fly really fast in different direction, has an helicopter. And so it gives me an idea of complete freedom. But it's also an insect that lives really, really, really for a very short time. So I have used this symbol as the, uh, the idea of freedom, but also the fragility of freedom. And I have begun making this project, drawing the face, the portrait of Isaiah Berlin on top of a Russian map and cutting the paper, cutting out uh, those dragonfly, cutting the dragonfly, holding the dragonfly and putting the dragonfly back with pin. As you know, uh, Costantino, um, during uh, history and uh, mostly in the um, historical, science historical museum, you used to see this collection of insects yeah. all pinned uh, in, uh, in box. And so this was a little bit the iconogra iconographical uh, references that, that I've used. Also to create the box and the frame of those big, big work. So, uh, as you can see, um, all, this, all this dragonfly are free, but if you see, they are flying all together like a troop of dragonfly until a common goal. And now I will explain you why. Um, Mr. Isaiah Berlin, this philosopher that I love a lot, was a great communicator and they asked him a lot of many, many times to do lecture at the BBC radio. Uh, he has done six incredible le lectures about six philosophers uh, of the period of the French Revolution around uh, the end of 19th century. Um, and these six enemies of freedom, used to call them the six enemies of freedom, are six philosophers. So here we have the Mestre, a French philosopher, uh, Ficht, a German philosopher, Helvetius, another French Illuminist philosopher, uh, Hegel, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, and Saint-Simon. So, uh, what I've done, another time, I have done those giant portraits using graphite. And another time, 
I have cut the portrait of those philosophers using this symbol of freedom. Why? Because Isaiah Berlin talked about those philosophers, but that have completely different idea of what uh, freedom is. But they all arrive to a certain point and they say, for many, many times, people have been under autocratic regime. So they, they don't know how to be free by themselves. So someone has to guide them to find their freedom. Those who have to guide could be a, polit a political party, uh, a head of a religion, uh, or for example, for the one that we are looking now, Helvetius, could be a group of scientists because he was an illuminist. But someone has to guide you. Someone has to guide the society to reach freedom. And this was the big trap that Isaiah Berlin uh, had seen mostly in how autocratic government during the 20th century have used this idea of guiding people to be free. So he was talking mostly about communist regime where uh, someone, where, where a leader have to tell everyone uh, where is freedom, putting off a lot of individual freedom. And this is the show that, that I have done in 2010 about those philosophers. And I was really inside this argument and so I have also made six interviews uh, with six contemporary philosophers that had the opportunity to work uh, at the beginning of their career with Isaiah Berlin. And they also talked a lot about freedom. So what was interesting for me making those kind of interview, it was that at the, at the beginning of the interview, every one of them, uh, say that he was a liberal thinker. But at the end, everyone has a different receipt uh, to how our society uh, could be free. So I say, oh, look, these liberal thinkers are very, very different one between another one. For that reason, I have decided to write an application to the Columbia University in the United States. Uh, also, if I am an artist, the application was for philosophy, uh, mixed with art, obviously. And I had the opportunity to go at Columbia University uh, with a research fellowship and to study some American liberal thinker and the difference between one to another one. Those philosophers can be very, very, very different. They can go, uh, they all are liberal, but they can go from one extreme to another extreme. The first extreme, um, it's Robert Nozick, that we can define him a sort of anarchist. Uh, he wrote in 1974, this book, Anarchist State and Utopia. Uh, to be brief, just uh, the, the fact of paying tax for him, it's not freedom. So the fact that people have to pay tax more than other one, it's not, for him, it's not an equal society. And uh, so to work on his topics, I have uh, done nine big work called The Tale of the Slave. And these are nine steps that he has described in his book uh, between a state of slavery and, um, sorry, between a condition of slavery and a condition of uh, democracy. And as you can see, every work uh, have inside a uh, scene of American political sat uh, satirical scene, uh, drawn it in giant dimension and uh, on top of them, there are cut out uh, sentences of this book. 
of uh, Nozick. But let's go ahead. One of the work that was most interesting for me during my residency in the United States was to ask people that were in the same time of me in New York, that we can define maybe one of the most free or it's commonly defined one of the most uh, free country in the world. Uh, so people that were with me uh, in New York at the same time, but every one of them uh, born in a different place of the world. And I was making their portrait and asking them, what is your own idea of freedom? So I have done this atlas of the different freedom that was really unexpected for me. Why it was unexpected, Costantino? Because I have understand how freedom is a really geographical topic. In the meaning that depending on where you're born from, you have a complete idea of freedom. Freedom could be something that you have uh, to fight for in certain country. People, uh, freedom could be something that have more men, less than women in other country. Or people could be, uh, freedom, sorry, could be something that your parents, your grandfather have fight for. Now your country is finally free and you don't know really how to manage this idea of freedom. So the idea of this work was to see how different people born in different places have a different idea of freedom. After, though, after this, I was quite interested in how freedom was maybe for me or for every one of us. So no more talking about a collective idea of freedom. You have to see all these dragonflies going into a, a common goal. So all like a troop of dragonfly. But I have thinking, let's go in a park. Let's lay down in the grass. And let's think about our personal freedom, our individual freedom. So I have imagined myself in the middle of a park with trees around me. And I have done a, a sort of map for every park that I was. Uh, this map was done um, with taking the highness of the trees that were around me and the display of the trees that were around me and creating, as you can see, those uh, shaped free, uh, frame that gave us the idea of the surrounding. But also here you can see that the drawing of the trees is, is from below looking on the top and with all those dragonfly uh, drawn it and displayed in a randomic way and no more as a troop of dragonfly to symbolize this idea of individual uh, freedom. So um, freedom, freedom, freedom. And more I was studying this subject and the more this world was going out of my comprehension. And this maybe uh, it's the particularity of the word freedom. In fact, Isaiah Berlin used to say that when someone think that he have understand what freedom is and he can have he, in his hand the solution in how people can be free, here it's the big trap. Because he would be, he, he will do everything he can to make his population free. And here is the trap, because mostly when you want that your population is free, you will do undemocratic thing to free, uh, to make free your population. And we have terrible example like Pol Pot or other regime during the history. So to end a little bit this, uh, 
this idea of freedom. Maybe where I have found the most incredible for me definition of freedom. I have found it on a Lebanese uh, poet, Khalil Gibran, that in 1924 read, uh, write this book, uh, The Prophet, and one of his poem was titled On Freedom. And I really invite every one of you, uh, it's a really uh, well-known poem on freedom by Khalil Gibran, and I really invite you to have a look uh, to this poem. Uh, what, uh, what Khalil Gibran say is that before to ask freedom uh, to the outside, freedom from a despot, freedom uh, from an autocratic party, first of all, you have to find freedom in your uh, inside, let's say, in your consciousness. So, First of all, you have to find freedom inside you and after uh, ask freedom outside. For that reason, I have created this a small house where you can go inside. The house is obviously an archetype of um, a quiet place. Uh, I've painted the house with a forest that could be a metaphor of being alone uh, somewhere. And I have cut it out the words of the poem uh, in this forest. Mm. So sorry to interrupt you. What I like, so thank you very much because even the passion you, you use to speak about your work is fantastic. Um, it's quite interesting coming down to a kind of method you use or process, or uh, no, speaking about the process you use for your work, um, that when you find a topic, you, you spoke about stratification. Uh, uh, well, uh, you really, really create layers. Well, and you work the opposite way of an archaeologist. The archaeologist dig, digs down the earth to find the, the different layers, to take the different layers out. You build layers, one on top of the other. And, and it's like a, sort of an endless research. Mm -hmm. uh, that like a spider no, takes you also not only in a vertical uh, process, but also in a, in a wide, large process to enlarge all the different points of views and the situations you may uh, think of when you deal with a, uh, with a topic like freedom. I love the fact that you started with portraits and you ended up to interview the people. This is a fantastic contemporary way of creating art out of an idea. Absolutely, and thank you. You know, um, uh, as you told, and as you know, I am Roman, and uh, Italian, and after Roman. And you know, uh, being Roman, it's particular, in the meaning that all the buildings that we see in our uh, city are the making of, of different century. Uh, a Middle Age building, it's born on a Roman building, a Renaissance uh, building will be built on top of the Middle Age one, destroying a part or taking some material from the cave of the incredible Roman uh, past to build up, for example, St. Peter and so every building, it's the result of layering and layering of history. And it's a little bit the way as I build up my work. Every work, it's uh, the layering of different history that create uh, an, an history. An history, it's never created but just someone who is talking, but about many people who are talking, many voices that create an history. So, um, when you were talking, I was uh, scrolling down some images uh, to arrive to this plane that is a plane that I have done for the National Gallery of Modern Art in Italy to celebrate the 100 year from the First World War. Celebrate a war, it's never something uh, nice. Uh, and so I have chosen uh, this plane 
uh, that it's a plane so for, from the First World War. And I have built up this plane in a real dimension, covering him with paper. And um, another time, as we have talked uh, for the tank, there is this contrast between uh, the fragility of the material and uh, what a war machine uh, do. And as you can see, another time, there is really this really layered surface that creates a sort of camouflage. This is the detail of the, um, the avion. The, of the plane, yeah. The plane. Yes. And um, another, uh, and I will go now, if you agree, a little bit more fast. Yes. Uh, so another topic that have interested me a lot uh, was the topic of colonization, what European have done uh, during the 19th, 18th, 19th century. Uh, so mostly uh, going in different parts of the world. And um, I was interested in, you know, those di uh, diary drawn it by uh, scientific anthropolog uh, anthropologists, uh, etc., that um, go with the colonial um, expedition and come back in Europe with this incredible book of drawing of insect, of population, of landscape, of architecture. And so this kind of drawing gave us the idea of what was the rest of the world. But uh, this was also drawing done by people who want to colonize some part of the world. For that reason, I have used another time the dragonfly as a symbol to pose a question. How many freedom uh, we have bring in the rest of the world, we as European people, we have bring in the rest of the people uh, of, the, of the world and how many uh, freedom we have taken out from uh, the original country. And so as you can see, there is a little bit this kind of atmosphere of old atlases with people and architecture painted on top of the map. This one, it's an atlas about animal. And this one, Costantino, it's done just with a lot of big pen, the one that you use also uh, in a everyday life. And this is uh, obviously a reference to an artist what, that we Alighiero love. Boetti. Alighiero Boetti, an artist that we love a lot in Italy, that used to work a lot with uh, big and, and also with atlases. A little bit more to our day. Another project that I've worked for uh, two or three years was a project about migration. Using the, um, the birds, uh, has a symbol. You know, yeah, we are Roman, but I think in all the parts of the world, you can find these uh, new orbs, uh, nuvole, come si dice, these clouds, clouds of birds uh, that are mi migrating. Uh, and so I have used this as a symbol. I will show you how. And another thing that I was interested on, it's how during history, the globe, Earth, has been projected into a bidimensional surface to create map. This is a geometric, something that has to do with geometric, but something that has to do a lot with politic. So this is the kind of uh, projection that he, we usually use. Uh, imagine Costantino to take a tennis ball, that is our planet, to put this tennis ball inside a, a cylinder and to project the axis and meridian inside the cylinder. After you will open, open and you will have a map, as you can see. This is called Mercator projection or cylindrical projection. And it's the one that we use at school and that mm -hmm. everyone use. 
Here you can see a map done with this kind of projection. But we have thousands of different ways to project our globe into a bidimensional surface. Imagine that if you want to build up a globe, you have to project the world into a 12 uh, speak, uh, slice, 12 slices, like an orange. Um, and then you can create a globe. Because otherwise, you can't take a bidimensional uh, piece of paper and put into um, a globe. You have to do these tw 12 slides. Mm -hmm. So here you can see a uh, different way to project the world and to create map. All the way are correct. There isn't a way that is more correct to another one. So I have choose this kind of projection, like this is a conical projection, to create uh, those big giant work that are uh, drawn with big pen, and where you can see uh, hundreds of people migrating from uh, a place to another one, and uh, like everyone of us do, like Homo sapiens have every uh, have done from the moment that he have uh, put his first step on his planet, he have to begin. He have begin began to to migrate, and so it it's what we are uh, doing also now. Depending in the century, you can find obstacle, you can find wall, you can find people uh, that make problem with the idea of migration, but has bird and has uh, all the animal, we, we will migrate. And so, as you can see, uh, here we have different uh, work that I have done on this topic of migration. Also with this strange uh, shape that is a star that come from a, a German uh, a geographer called Berghaus, and sometimes my work uh, becomes also, become also architecture, like uh, in, in this case, the star became a scenography. I will, I will show you directly the images of this scenography that I have done for Christian Dior in 2017 in Paris. And the idea was what we call Teatro Mundi, uh, Baroque theater, uh, the Teatro della Meraviglia, the theater of uh, wonder. Wonder, thank you, Costantino. Uh, where in an only place you can see the wonder of nature of five continent. So, and also uh, the wonder of the sky. So, this was the set that I have drawn and made in Paris. Uh, you can see a star with five points, and for each point, I have created animal and taken plants from every part of the world to represent the continent. And on top of them, <coughs> sorry, you have this giant dome with the constellation. You see the animal, another time, they're very big, but another time, they're represented as a toy, you know toy that uh, uh, you can use uh, when you are children. But they're very, very big. You know, uh, changing scale is something that contemporary artists usually love a lot. <laughs> and um, if you agree, I will go uh, in the next five minutes to the end. So if you have a question or if our uh, guest have uh, other question I will be happy to, to reply. Uh, the last five minutes of our conversation uh, are about an idea of common values. So for me a country it's not defined but some uh, line, red line uh, drawn it on top of a map to create border. But a country or a continent, it's defined by the people who have lived 
during the history in this continent. So this time I have created a map just using people. People, people may be coming from different parts of the world. If you see here, it's North America and you have Native American, uh, you have people coming from Africa, obviously during 17th century, or uh, people coming from Europe. For me, what I want to say that everyone is part of the history or of the value of the country. Here you can see a very nice map of Africa and you can see many history. Uh, obviously I have selected just some, but there are thousands of other history, but uh, it's just to give an idea of that, of the meaning that a country, it's not defined just by square and it's defined by, by people that have uh, done the history of this country. When I say done the history, it doesn't mean that these people have to be the president uh, of the country or a general of uh, um, a troop, but it could be my history, your history, the history of everyone living in, in a country. And here we are uh, in the work that I would like to show to all of you, that is the work that it's now uh, in the Italian embassy, uh, thanks to another time to the ambassador, and uh, the work called Italy Done with Pieces, or Italia Pezzi. Uh, as you can see, Italy, it's represented as um, a scala, a, a ladder. ladder a ladder inside the Mediterranean Sea, a, a ladder used by many, many people to climb uh, from South to North Europe. And also these uh, images is surrounded by those birds that are migrating. Um, just let me show you the last work that uh, if you agree, Constantino, if we are in time. Um, the last work are about constellation. So no more using geographical and political map to do our trip because those maps are really precise, but sometimes they come not uh, reliable because of the political changement. And so I have imagined people doing their trip, looking at the stars, uh, looking at the constellation. And this was a show that I've done in India, the Indian Museum in Calcutta. Uh, it's a wonderful museum with a wonderful wings of anthropology. And this is my reference about constellation, the map of constellation, that it's a map that comes from the antique Greek and it's always been the same from 3,000 uh, year to our day. Uh, and so I have done also globe uh, with constellation, uh, like new tools to make our trip. No more looking at political changement, but looking at stars. And here I am. This is just last year with my last work about um, tiles and nature and uh, uh, the subject of water. So as you have seen in all this presentation, all my work are linked to contemporary or, or to history, but more, mostly to people. So thanks very, very much to Lisa. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you. Uh, it was really, really interesting. It was... Uh... A, a, a real like flight uh, into your world, into your work. Um, I am sure that because you are such a sponge that the, the moment you're gonna get to uh, down to Zambia, you're gonna find more subjects to work on. You're gonna bring back home many, many um, topics to work on. And I'm sure since you're also available in experimenting different techniques, uh, every time 
that you will find uh, also interesting uh, different ways of working over there. This is really, really what I expect because the idea, and I'm talking to the artists that are connected and to William Miko that uh, just posed a question and we're gonna answer it too. Um, it's, the idea is not that the, the, the art artists like uh, Pietro comes, they make their show and then they go away. It's a, a really, a, it's gonna be a way of uh, sharing experiences. Mm -hmm. So thank you very much. I look forward and thanks uh, to the ambassador to inviting me because uh, I really look forward to discover this incredible country and to be inspired. It's something that I usually do to travel a lot and to be inspired and to create projects. So Pietro, William Miko, who's a friend, an artist, um, asked this, uh, what significance has a dragonfly in Italian or the Roman tradition? Because it appears to be recurring, a recurring theme in a number of artistic depictions. Mm? So I have an answer, but I want you to know what, what, what's, gonna, what's your point of view about that. Huh? So why so, do you pick the dragonfly? What's the meaning of dragonfly? Uh, thanks a lot to the question. And I would like that Costantino, that is uh, an historian, replied to the first part of the question. So what in history, uh, uh, how this symbol has been used. And for me, as I told you, uh, I have used this symbol uh, like a symbol of freedom uh, and uh, to, to mean the fragility of freedom. But I am very, very curious, like you, to listen to Costantino and listen how, uh, during their history, this symbol uh, uh, is used. But actually, I thought you knew because the, 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 in the Italian art, artists use uh, dragonfly with the same meaning. I mean, it's, it's it, the, the meaning, the, like the, the longest meaning he had in the arts and the culture is freedom. Freedom because it's, as you said, it's light. Freedom because it's, uh, it really looks free when it flies. Mm -hmm. But the ancient Romans, so in the ancient Roman literature and in the mythology, um, dragonfly has also got the meaning of balance, equilibrium. Mm -hmm. And this is mostly because of its shape, no? because it's got a line in the middle and it's completely symmetrical and it really looks uh, perfectly balanced even when it flies and when it, no, it stops you know, in, suspended in the air, it really is perfectly balanced. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and also the name, because in Italian, the name is libellula, whereas balance, it, it's, it's, it's libra. So they have the same root, L-I-B. Mm? So most probably the name in Italian, libellula, comes from the, the, the word libra in Latin. Uh? Uh, so this is uh, uh, the meaning of, we answered to, to, to William. Then Chanda Katema uh, answered, I know I shouldn't be in the question section without a question, uh, but I really love the presentation by Peter Rufo. Grazie mille. So it's not a question, it's just a comment. Uh, thank you, Chanda. Thank you very much for being with us. Ambassador, any question from your side? Thank you. Thank, thank you, Costantino. And thank you to Pietro. Uh, it's been... Uh, a very inspiring uh, conversation, uh, a flight uh, in uh, the contemporary art uh, uh, to which uh, Pietro took us. Um, I, first of all, uh, would like to uh, share with you that uh, among our friends here in the Zambia Italian Cultural Center in Lusaka, there is also the ambassador of uh, Zambia to Italy, oh, really? His Excellency Ambassador Joseph Katema, who is here, and I would like to greet him very warmly. And uh, I would like to extend to him uh, the invitation that uh, Pietro did uh, at the beginning uh, to, so for the ambassador to visit uh, the atelier of Pietro. Uh, because, uh, as, as uh, you said, 
it's like visiting a Renaissance atelier. I had uh, the luck and the pleasure to visit the, the atelier. It's uh, really beautiful. And I'm sure that Ambassador Katema will be looking forward to that uh, uh, in Rome. Uh, to share the art of Pietro, uh, of course, not all our Zambian friends can travel to, uh, to Rome as they wish. Uh, maybe they will one day, but they don't have to wait because the Italian residence uh, is open. Uh, I will uh, be very happy to welcome all the friends that are online and that uh, want to uh, see the art piece uh, Italia uh, Fatta Pezzi, Italy made in pieces that uh, we have, uh, thanks to Pietro, we host uh, at the Italian residence. It's a beautiful art piece. Um, I would like to ask to all our friends who are here in the in the ZIG if there are any questions. So if you have any questions, you can come here to the microphone to uh, put a question to uh, Pietro or Costantino. I also have uh, some remarks because uh, as a participant to this conversation, I, I was really impressed by the um, by the messages and by the the, uh, the the concepts that Pietro with his arts can uh, share with us, uh, uh, the concept and the, I think Pietro made a very important point when he said that contemporary art puts questions to us, maybe mm, doesn't give the answers, but is, um, uh, uh, suggesting uh, questions, uh, putting questions to that that the artists want to share with us, and and that's why, as we said at the beginning, there are no boundaries, uh, and the art can allow people to dialogue uh, from all over the world. And and what Pietro said about uh, the use of uh, symbols as an alphabet. You know? So, for example, he talked about uh, the dragonfly we have in Zambia, of course, too, and uh, even now when you go around, you can uh, see many. So it's, uh, it's, uh, it's uh, a message for uh, each of us. Uh, what, is, uh, what is our freedom? What we want to do with our freedom? And I also like very much uh, how the dragonflies were put uh, in, the, in the art pieces uh, in a balanced way, but uh, representing uh, how all of us in this life go ahead with our freedom and we also have to uh, take responsibility for our, for our uh, freedom uh, together with the fragility. So many, many inputs that I think are very important. The symbol of, of the skull uh, as well, uh, when you were talking about self-defense uh, and how uh, we, we moved from uh, the Ministry of War to the Ministry of Defense so how in our concept we, we change the approach. And also, as you said, uh, sorry if I jump from one point to the other, but also the importance of geography, as you said, Peter, because, uh, and especially it's very important as we travel around the world and then we, we experience different uh, uh, countries, there are different uh, concepts in different uh, geographical areas about the same concept that we have, but still, as humankind, uh, we all share these big questions and uh, these challenges, and we have to find our own uh, answers to that. So um, I don't know if there is any question. Ambassador, please join. Pietro has got another five minutes. I'm so sorry about that, but he's uh, expected to another lecture in 10 minutes. So thank you, Ambassador, for joining this lecture. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I do not agree with uh, Ambassador Antoni when he says well. that uh, uh, your work poses only questions to us, but uh, when I look uh, very carefully into your question, 
I, I can see some answers. Even in your questions, I can see some answers. So, um, I would very much want to congratulate uh, Pietro for the work. Um, if that is what uh, contemporary art is, then uh, I think I've fallen in love with contemporary art. While I was seated here, at one time, I would think that I am in a history lecture room. All of a sudden, I think I'm listening to a political analyst. You're right. All of a sudden, I think I am listening to a historian. So all the all the sciences, social sciences, which uh, we learn as a uh, humanity, are all encompassed in your work. So that is one thing I have uh, learned. I, I wish, I hope, all the contemporary artists uh, are doing the same. Uh, I've got no question, actually. In your question, I did see answers as well, even if you didn't pronounce them. Thank you very much. Many, 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 many thanks to you to being here and uh, to share with us the, your time. And uh, I really thanks for the words that you have used regarding my work. And uh, it means for me a lot. And uh, many, many thanks. And as you have seen, uh, I say that I just uh, pose question, but it's true, like every one of us have his own opinion. And so there are also some answer in my work. Many thanks. Thank you very much. Uh, so there was another question by uh, Lalita uh, that we don't have the time to answer now, but if you can, uh, ah, there is another question. Uh, I don't know if Pietro has got time. Uh, one you have one quick minutes? question uh, from, from here. One, the last okay. question. Here. Okay, great, sorry. Pleasure. Okay, thank you so much. My name is Zumani Piri. Uh, thank you for the presentation, and I love the I loved your definition of freedom when you said that it is it is dependent on where you come from. Now, my question goes: um, often co contemporary art resonates with music. I just want to know: does music play a role in your work? And if yes, how? And what type of music do you listen to that influences your work? I don't know. Nice. Thanks a lot for your question and. You know, uh, I'm not a young artist, uh, but I like to think of me like a young artist and that uh, uh, a lot of here have to come in front of me. So this question about music, it's very interesting for me because um, I have not worked directly with music, but I've worked uh, on some Italian uh, musician like Gioacchino Rossini that was one of the greatest um, composer of opera, opera writer uh, and I've done uh, a show on his work so but, and also the work that you can see here uh, on my back it's part of this show about Rossini and uh, but what you told me uh, opened me a sort of giant window and a fascinating window to mix art with music that uh, it's not something that I've already done or not in a really specific way. And maybe uh, if you will be uh, there when I will come uh, to your country, you could, you could be my guide to discover the music of your country and maybe it could be something really inspiring for the project that I will do uh, there. So thanks a lot for this suggestion. Thank you, Pietro. I think uh, this is uh, the best way to conclude our conversation uh, as a bridge toward the 
your uh, visit to Zambia with uh, already many ideas to develop. Uh, so I wish uh, to thank the opportunity to thank you very much for this uh, afternoon with us. Uh, and uh, we will be really looking forward to welcoming uh, you here. Uh, let's keep in touch on the project. And uh, let me thank also, of course, uh, Costantino, for who is uh, the mastermind of uh, this project uh, uh, between uh, Italy and Zambia. So thank you to both of you very much uh, and uh, see you soon. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you. Bye. Bye-bye. Thank you, Pietro. Thank you.